Hello, uh, my name is Nick Chater from Warwick Business School's Behavioural Science Group, and I'm giving a brief talk on AI and the singularity for the Warwick Behavioural Insights Team Summit. Sadly, um, not happening in person due to COVID-19, but um, very delighted that it's uh, going ahead in virtual form. So I have one simple message, uh, and I want to back that simple message up with a few considerations. And the simple message is, don't worry about the singularity. The idea that at some point, perhaps fairly soon, um, we may get to the point where computers are smarter than we are. And of course, once they're smarter than we are, that would be pretty alarming because they'd be able to create even smarter computers which are even smarter than they were, and then there'd be a, a presumably extremely rapid enhancement of the, uh, the intelligence of the smartest things on the planet, and they would not be us. So this would be, if we hit it, this singularity extremely concerning. And I don't think people should not think about this problem. I think they should think about it. Uh, there are all kinds of extremely long shot concerns we should be worried about. But I think it's a bit like being struck by an asteroid, um, possibly less likely than that, uh, and something that we should, uh, should not actually lose sleep over, but that we should be concerned about it at some level. Someone somewhere on the planet should be worrying about it. Um, but I want to try and persuade you that this is something that's so far in the future that it's sort of unimaginable at the moment. Now, why should I, as a psychologist rather than AI researcher, be saying this? Um, well, I think there are a couple of reasons. Uh, one reason is that um, people in the psychology and cognitive science community are very interested in trying to build computational models of the mind. And uh, one of the shocking things about that uh, project, which I've been involved with for over uh, three decades, is just how incredibly hard it is how it's extremely difficult to capture the intelligence and flexibility of human cognition in just about any way whatsoever. Um, so you can build models of very, very simple aspects of human behavior and thought, but almost invariably, they fail to generalize and be as clever as we are in almost uh, 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 falling over at almost every hurdle you can give them. So I think the experience of trying to think about how to build formal computational models of how we work is, uh, is a rather rather ch chastening one. It certainly doesn't let, lead one to think, crikey, we're nearly there, we've almost done it. We've nearly created um, systems to model ourselves which are almost as clever as we are, quite the opposite. So that's the first reason. Um, and the second reason is, is that I think there are some systematic things we know about how our minds work, which tells us that they work in really different ways from artificial systems that we currently understand anyway. And that's what I want to focus on much more now. So what I want to, to try to remind you of is just how astonishingly flexible and creative and improvisational the mind is. So this, is, this, this in a slogan for me is the idea of the mind is, the mind is flat. Um, so rather than having enormous sort of pre-configured depths of knowledge, which one could imagine if they were real, um, programming up into a computer, and there'd, be, there'd be a lot of information uh, and you'd have to program it for a very long time or, or somehow learn it from the environment. But you could at least conceive of how were our minds um, built on a vast, vast database, we could somehow try to replicate that database. But I think that's not really the right story at all. Um, the right story is that we're using not very large amounts of information, uh, both from our senses, where we actually pick up very little information from the external world, surprisingly, surprisingly little, and from our memories, which are also extremely sketchy. But we are fantastically good at using that information to create extremely sophisticated and rich um, behaviors and thoughts in the moment. We are amazing improvisers. Now the thing about our improvisation is it's so fantastically good that we don't realize we're improvising at all. So if you ask me how, why I understand a particular sentence in the way I do, or why I made a particular action at a particular point, I will certainly give you a story about that. I can talk for ages and we all can about the origins of our behaviors and the nature of those behaviors. But though, that's just more improvisation for my money. The story itself is one of creation in the moment through remarkable creativity. So if you ask me why I behave, do the things I do, I'm sort of like an author. And this author is a, is a very convincing author, so convincing I convince myself. But instead of thinking, I'm making it up as I go along, I think, no, no, I'm just reporting uh, what's in my mind. But I'm not, in fact, doing that. Now, there's plenty of um, plenty of experimental evidence for this improvisational process. And I don't want to go into that now because that would take a long way uh, into a completely different uh, territory. Uh, but I will give you one example. And one, exa the one example is from the remarkable work on split brain patients by Michael Gazaniga. 
uh, starting in the 70s. So what Gazaniga did was look at people who've had the, brain, the two halves of the brain separated, usually for, um, uh, to, to reduce very severe epilepsy from spreading from one half of the brain to the other. And the, each half of the brain can understand um, language independently and act independently. In fact, of course, as we all know, the left half of the brain is much better at processing language and the right half doesn't process it very well. But um, because of the way the, the, the um, brain is, is wired, you can also um, you can use this uh, split both to give information to one half of the brain uh, independently by feeding information through the left or the right half of the visual field. And you can get the system to behave in a way that's going to depend only on one half of the brain by choosing to getting people to make responses with the left or the right hand. And oddly, as it happens, uh, everything's crossed over. So the left half of my visual field feeds to my right, right half of my brain, and the right half of my visual field feeds to the left half of my brain, and the same story goes for hands as well. So my left hand is controlled by my right brain, and the right brain is the left right hand is controlled by the left. Now, the, the, I won't go into the specifics here, but um, but the trick that Gazaniga plays on people uh, in this position is he asks their right brain uh, to do something. That's the, mostly the non-language brain. It has some residual language, but not much. And the right brain makes, uh, for example, sees an image and, and, and makes an action. And then the left brain has to explain why. And of course, the left brain doesn't know why, because the left brain um, is a separate from the right brain, and the right brain has just gone off and done something. And what, the, what is remarkable is that the left brain is able to spin a story perfectly happily. It has no idea. It can't possibly have any idea about why the right brain has made a particular choice or action. But in fact, the left brain will explain it. Even better than that, because of the clever way Gazanik has set up his studies, the left brain is spinning a story which we know to be wrong. So the left brain will take in the information that it can see, and it's not what the right brain is actually seeing. We know the right brain is seeing different things. So the right brain is um, following different information and making a choice that the left brain knows nothing about. But the left brain thinks, well, I know this, and I see the choice is that. I bet you that's what it is. The left brain improvises an answer. So from the point of view of the agent, the remarkable thing is that the, um, the, the person who's do, doing the task can explain verbally just as well what their left and right hands are doing. In the case of the right hand, that's been controlled by the left brain. So the brain, the left brain actually, which is where the language is, is actually got in principle access to the uh, information that drove the right hand to move. But when we're looking at the right hand, which is um, so the left hand, which is controlled by the right brain, that's not true at all. So the language centers have no way of knowing what the, what the right brain is doing. And they give the wrong answer, but they give it with great fluidity, very great confidence, just as easily and, um, uh, and, and convincingly as, as before. So the thing is, what's going on there is that you've got this thing that um, Gazanica calls the interpreter, this left brain language system, that is explaining something completely from, through just an observation and cleverness, and wrongly, um, just as well as it's explaining the actions of its own half of the brain. And that makes you suspect, suspect and Gazanica suspected this too, that what's actually going on when the left brain is explaining its own actions, they're explaining bits of the um, uh, bits, bits of movement for the, of the right hand, which are in fact um, generated by the left half of the brain with the language centers. It's explaining those in the same way. It's not actually looking inside the, um, the activity of the brain and saying, aha, I see uh, the traces of my cunning plan, the reason that I do what I did. I see it there and I'm now going to tell you all about it. No, it doesn't do that. Uh, it never does that. It can't do that. What it does is it sees the uh, action it's, it takes them into account of what it, how it reads the environment and thinks, well, that would be a sensible explanation for that action. I bet that's why I did it. That's rationalization, that's post hoc creation of a, of, a, of a fantasy. In the case where you're, the wrong half of your brain is making the decision, of course, that must be, must be an incorrect fantasy. Now, the thought here is that in general, in general, this is the way the mind is working. So when you're in any way probing your mind, wondering, what happened, why you did something, um, you're always in a process of, of creative invention. And we're so unbelievably good at this invention that we don't, as I say, we don't realize we're being inventive at all. We're just, um, we're just uh, telling it how it is. We think we're reporting, but we're not really reporting. 
Another example, and that will be it for examples, um, but I want just to, write, to give you a sense of the, the, um, uh, the, the, the scope of this kind of phenomenon. Another example, which is very familiar to all of us, is perception. So if I ask you how you see the world, you think, well, it's all full of color and detail. I see great swathes of text. I see seas of faces, which I can individually, um, individually identify. But actually, we know, absolutely know for sure, that well, that's not the case. And the reason we know that, apart from many other things, is just that the, the visual system is, uh, is, is, is built in such a way that, for example, color is only really perceptible in the sort of a degree or two of visual angle, just right where you're looking. And colors receptors, the, the cone receptors for color, are, taper off very severely outside that. And outside of about 10 degrees of visual angle, there's no color receptors at all. So you really don't know the color uh, of anything outside of 10 degrees and you don't really know much about the color except for that one or two degree patch but the trouble is that's not what it feels like i think i've created for myself the illusion that the world is fully colored and i can see all those colors and similarly i think i can see all that detail too and the cone cells do the detail as well as the color so that's not right either and in fact there are many experiments and i won't go into the really won't go into these um, which show that if you cunningly change parts of an image you're not directly looking at you just don't notice now, the point here is that the brain, again, is improvising an impression of a rich visual world. But that is a mere illusion. Um, it's not really the case that we've encoded the entire image, uh, image in front of us, or indeed the entire state of our body, or the entire um, auditory environment, the things we're listening to. That's not right at all. We're focusing on one thing at a time, pretty much exactly one thing, in my view, but others might um, have a slightly more liberal interpretation. Um, but it's very, very, very limited our uh, connection with the perceptual world. We're, the fact, fact that we have this sense of richness is again a matter of improvisation. And the improvisation works like this. You ask me, what color is that book in the distance? And I have a quick look at it and I think, oh, orange. And I think to myself, because I made that up so quickly and I just answered your question by having a quick look and, and, re and, and reading off the answer, I think I knew that all along, but I didn't know that all along. I thought it was represented in my mind, but it wasn't. I made it up. I made it up at the point you asked me the question. Now, the thing is that this is absolutely remarkable phenomenon. We should, we might think, crumbs, I, I thought I had all this tremendous amount of knowledge and I thought I had this tremendous rich connection with reality. Um, that's you know, a terrible blow to me and to my sense of myself as a sophisticated cognitive agent. But you shouldn't think that at all, I think. Instead, you should think, my goodness, what amazing creative improvising machines we are. We have so little information to go on. We pick up little scraps of perceptual information. We create this sense this, this improvised sense of an entire rich, detailed, colored visual world, which is in fact completely fake. And also we create this sense of an incredibly rich, detailed a sense of ourselves, which is also pretty much completely fake as well. Now, this is very, um, very remarkable, but it's very, very, very mysterious. We have no idea how to build the computational system that can do this. The computational systems we have built, particularly in recent machine learning, uh, are really good at taking extremely large amounts of data, for example, vast numbers of images, perhaps even hundreds of millions or billions of images, or vast, vast swathes of text, and making inferences about other very similar images or very similar bits of text. So if you want to translate something from English to French, you need to have an awful lot of English and French lined up, and lots of separate chunks of English and French is helpful too. You do massive statistical analysis, and then I give you a little fragment of one language in it, it can be um, knitted to produce a plausible fragment of the other language. Or if you want to identify an object in a scene, that's a central large object in a, in a, in a, in a not too cluttered scene, otherwise it gets a bit difficult. Um, you can do that, but only because you've got this gigantic database, hundreds of millions probably, of, of images, and you're comparing, or the system is comparing, um, not in a way that's particularly transparent, but it's comparing the, the new problem to the old problems it's dealt with before. But the human brain isn't really like that at all. We take very tiny numbers of examples, very abstractly and vaguely specified, and we make enormous leaps, great metaphorical, wild, analogical leaps from a small number of examples to new examples. So whereas um, most successes in at least modern machine learning type of, types of AI and big deep, deep neural networks and so on, they work by an extremely data-intensive strategy. You have a vast number of data points and you extrapolate very minimally from those data points. The human brain doesn't work like that at all. We have much less data, but we extrapolate much more wildly and much more in a much more sophisticated way.
and using incredibly rich metaphorical processes we simply don't understand. So my lesson from that is that we have no idea how the mind works. We don't have any idea how it's possible to do such extraordinarily sophisticated, um, rich generalization. And the fact, that we, the fact that we don't understand it is telling us that we can't possibly um, have the ghost of a clue how to build a machine to do this. I have no reason to believe that we'll have any more idea how to do that in a hundred years time than we do now, but, but maybe we will. Um, but I think we have not, we have no worries at all that anything we're building now is remotely going to be threatening. I want to finish very briefly with an analogy. So the invention of the motor car, indeed the invention of the internal combustion engine underlying motor cars and trains, and buses and coaches and so on, uh, was an enormous revolution. And compared to horse-drawn vehicles was a, an enormous step forward. And I want to stress that I think that developments in machine learning and artificial intelligence are similar. They are massively important. They will change our lives. They are changing our lives. In fact, the computer is, has changed our lives and so has obviously the internet. But nonetheless, remember, though life-changing it was, the motor car is not an artificial horse. A horse is a phenomenally sophisticated thing which can reproduce itself, has an incredibly complicated anatomy and physiology, a brain of enormous power compared to any computer we can build, most likely. Uh, has extraordinary um, perceptual and motor abilities, can jump over fences with, with, with spindly legs and, and, and land successfully on the other side. And can do dressage and all sorts of strange and complicated things and obviously live, live in the wild in, 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 in groups and so on. Now, motor cars don't attempt remotely to replicate the horse. The idea that one might, if one were a horse, think, well, these motor cars, they're a real worry. They'll be, you know, they'll be doing everything we do before, before you know it. At the moment, they're just driving along, but the next minute they'll be, they'll be reproducing and living in social groups and, and doing dressage and jumping over fences. Well, you'd be completely wrong because in fact, uh, motor cars do what horses do in one regard, which is pull things along and go quickly. Um, but they do it in a completely different way from horses. And there's no way in the world they're going to suddenly generalize to start doing all the other things that horses do. And I think that's exactly the same when we look at artificial intelligence, machine learning of our time. It's tremendous, it's tremendously important. If it's as important as the motor car or the internal combustion engine, it's, that's important, and maybe, maybe more so. But it isn't in any way replicating human cognition. It's doing something that we do, and it's doing it in a really different way. But it's no more appropriate to, uh, to fear that we're going to find that our, our, our intelligence has been somehow usurped by these um, algorithms we built uh, at the moment, then it would be reasonable to think that the, the, the motor car would, would have the full functionality of an actual live horse. Final thought, it's just obvious to us, of course, that creating artificial life from scratch is just a total mystery. The idea of trying to build a robotic fly that would uh, fl fl fly about with the dexterity and cleverness of an actual, uh, an actual fly and that could reproduce and lay eggs and so on. I mean, you know, this is, this is complete fantasy. We don't imagine for a second that we can do that. In fact, we can't build a bacterium. Now we understand a lot about biology. Um, it's, it's remarkable what has been uncovered. We have no idea how to build something as simple as a bacteria. So the idea that we can build something as clever as a human brain should at least be viewed with enormous skepticism. Uh, I don't think it's impossible in principle in the sense that there's something non-mechanical or somehow uh, spiritually, um, uh, sp spiritually significant about human minds that couldn't possibly be replicated in, 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 uh, in machines. I think that uh, we are material objects, as, uh, among other things, and in principle, we could, be, um, we, we could be created artificially by manipulation of physical material. But we haven't got the remotest idea how to do that. And since we can't build a bacterium, I'm pretty worried, I'm, I'm worried that we can build anything as sophisticated as a human brain.